Negro Tales, Tesney the Deceived. Tesney, the frail, the good, the beautiful mulatto, was known of child, man, woman, and beast. Wait, Tesney, we have something good for you and a secret to tell. Daily, such invitations came from the white children of the neighborhood. Daily, Tesney ate good things and listened to talks about dolls, playmates, stories, and so on. The dogs that accompanied the children pulled Tesney's apron strings and seemed to enjoy her good nature and the confidence of her little white friends. What a servant she is, said white family men as they passed. She fondles the babies, and they do not cry. She talks, and the older children listen. She moves, and they follow her. She does not command, but they do her bidding. There should be a million such as she. She is a lady born, said the white women. May no ill befall her. Tesney was servant to Mrs. Wakeley, a wealthy southern white woman. Tesney's presence was energy to the other young Negro servants. They thought of her and put thought into their work. They looked at her and dignified their persons. There may be queens of the kitchen as well as queens of the parlor, said they. We belong to the first. Let us glory in the honor. The lace curtains at the window, the pictures on the wall, the lint on the carpet, the china in the closet, the wearing apparel of Mrs. Wakeley, and the food on the table, all knew the touch of Tesney's delicate yellow hand. The washerwoman followed her instructions, and the clothes lasted months longer. The other servants learned, through her, that honesty in a servant is a greater virtue than dignity in a parlor queen, and the grocery bill was reduced ten per cent. She studied the needs of the family, and expenses were reduced ten per cent more. Her forethought for the family and her genius in arranging games and work for the children gave Mrs. Wakeley many hours of leisure and comfort. The house can do without me for hours, said Mrs. Wakeley to her guests, but it cannot do without Tesney for a minute. Tesney's mother was a mulatto, with the hair and features of that type. She died when Tesney was too young to know anything about her. Tesney never knew her father, but she had a suspicion. Her suspicion was wrong, and it caused all her trouble. She heard Agnes, who knew her mother, talk, and it was upon Agnes's talk that Tesney had founded her suspicion. He is my father, she often said to herself as a certain rich man of another race passed by, he will give me something some day. On her twenty-third birthday, she saw Mrs. Wakeley in company with this man. After leaving the man, Mrs. Wakeley said, Tesney, here is a ring your father sent to you. Look on the inside of it. Tesney looked and read, To my daughter, Tesney. The man, Mrs. Wakeley? Tesney asked. Your father. His name, please? Do you not know? Has not Agnes told you all about it? She said she would. Tesney wore the ring and renewed her hopes of getting something from the man whom she considered her father. That very afternoon, a pony, hitched to a dog cart and driven by Tesney, became frightened and ran. To keep the two children behind her from jumping from the cart, and receiving unnecessary bruises, Tesney held them with one hand and gripped the lines with the other. However, the animal's wild flight was of short duration, for the man of Tesney's suspicion stopped the pony and led the now docile beast back to Mrs. Wakeley's gate. As Tesney lifted the crying children from the cart, he said, Tesney, you are a good, brave girl. I was talking to Mrs. Wakeley this morning about you. I gave her a ring for you. How do you like the present? Well, sir, well, answered Tesney. There were tears in her eyes, but the man did not see them. Tesney, continued the man, how would you like to live with me? Well, sir, well, answered Tesney. 
Mrs. Wakeley now hurried from the house, having witnessed the misadventure of the pony cart. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bankner, thank you, she cried. The children are all right, are they not? Tesney is a good, brave girl, isn't she? She is that and more, replied the man, as he bowed and departed. Tesney wore the ring, remembered the invitation, and renewed her hopes. Three months from that day, Tesney stood behind Aunt Agnes, combing her hair while Agnes examined the ring. Agnes was about sixty years old, an ex-slave, a meddler, and liar. Her three hundred and fifty pounds kept her in her armchair. There she made the coffee, beat the biscuits, abused the cook, lied to Mrs. Wakeley, said the blessing, and urged all to live good Christian lives. She had nursed Tesney and knew her ancestry. She called Tesney her daughter and wished her for a daughter-in-law. Tesney was fond of Agnes, but scorned her son, who was unfit for any woman. Read, Aunt Agnes, said Tesney, while I comb. No, you just stop combing and read. Tesney read the inscription and dropped a word about her suspicion. Now, comb on, child. Me, my, whoo, stop, child, stop. That comb's mighty fine. What that you say about them ring words and that big white man? Tesney repeated the inscription and emphasized her suspicion. Is that so? asked Agnes doubtfully. Didn't you as good as say so, Aunt Agnes? Maybe I did, child. Now, look here, child. Is you going to be my daughter-in-law? Aunt Agnes, it cannot be. You know your son is a bad man. Yes, child, but a bad man needs a good wife. Thanks, Aunt Agnes, but it cannot be. George, you trifling rascal, come here, Agnes called to her son. George entered and smiled at Tesney, who frowned and turned her back upon him. Son, continued Agnes, daughter says no, it's good enough. Go, you trifling rascal, go. George went. Child, said Agnes, with a great show of kindness, you is right. You knows that you is good-blooded stock. Fine, stylish, white blood runs in your veins. You is right, child. Look up. Look up. You knows what the yeast does for the bread. White dignity does that for your blood. You knows what the scarecrow does for the cornfield. White wisdom does that for your womanhood. What the steam does for the steam cow. White go-ahead does for you. You is right, child. Look up. Now you must be feeling mighty good, ain't you? George is a little old no account, but Agnes will work for Tesney, and George will work for Tesney. And won't that be a good bargain? Honey, child, say that it will, and please the heart of poor old Agnes. And Agnes, it cannot be. Does you mean that, child? I mean it, Aunt Agnes. Does you mean every word of it? I mean every word of it. Now I's gwine to make you a speech, you half-white nig. You thinks because your face ain't what you call real black, and cause your hair ain't smack dab to your head, and because of... Oh, Tesney, honey child, don't cry that way. Aunt Agnes was just a foolin'. I takes it all back. Let me kiss you all over the face. Dear now, I knows that you's in good humor. You sees, child, how Aunt Agnes can hurt your feelings. You better be George's wife, then have your feelings hurt all the time. It cannot be, Aunt Agnes. Don't ask me any more. Now I'll say the rest of my speech. It'll not be a speech of words, nother. It'll be one of acts. It'll hit you hard. It'll make you shame to yourself. It'll drive your friends and turn their backs upon you. It'll put you out of doors. It'll make you say, I's a fool, a fool. It'll hit you hard, hard. Agnes stopped to breathe. Mrs. Wakeley entered the kitchen. Tesney was looking at the ring. Your mother was a woman nearly white, and your father was an egg man. My father, gasped Tesney. 
I have always learned that my father was, your father was what I tells you, child. What have you always told me? Listen, I tells you the facts. I tells you the facts. Aunt Agnes, screamed Tesney. Tesney, said Mrs. Wakeley. That information seems to trouble you. <laughs> the child. <laughs> Agnes stops to hold her sides. Why, Agnes, what is the matter? asked Mrs. Wakeley. But the child thinks the man what give you that ring for her is her father. Do you, Tesney? asked Mrs. Wakeley sharply. Tesney put the ring on her finger and remained silent. Speak, Tesney. The matter is serious, demanded Mrs. Wakeley. I do, answered Tesney. Did not Mr. Banker give you the ring for me? He did. Did you not say that the ring was sent to me by my father? Your father sent it to you, but another man brought it to me. Is you smart enough to see the difference between the sending and the bringing of the thing, child? Tesney looked at Mrs. Wakefield and nodded. Have you not deceived yourself? I have in part. Aunt Agnes here. The child lies, the child lies. Mrs. Wakeley, the child lies. Be quiet, Agnes, demanded Mrs. Wakeley. You are too fat to become eloquent with ease and safety. She better be, said the washerwoman, who happened to stop at the window a few seconds. All the coffins about here is for heavenly-sized people. Agnes, in a rage at this interruption, turned and threw the rolling pin at the washerwoman, but she was at a safe distance. Tesney, Agnes said that she would explain this whole affair to you. Mrs. Wakeley, you has knowed old Agnes a long, long time, and just as sure as you and me is gwine to the same heaven, just so sure I was gwine to tell this child the whole truth but she kept on making the looking glass talk about her face and her hair that I just thought I'd fling her out a little hint and lay low. I knew your father, Tesney, and as Agnes says, he was a Negro. I reckon you'll believe now, shouted Agnes. The white folks done said so. Here's your rolling pin, said the washerwoman as she paused at the window on return. Hand it here, demanded Agnes. I will when you is of her sweet temper, answered the washerwoman. Please to explain about my father and the ring. Your father, Tesney, Mrs. Blakely went on, was reared in Mr. Bankner's family. He married a woman whom none of us, save Agnes, ever knew. Shortly after the death of your mother, he killed a man in self-defense. Mr. Bankner's people, knowing the circumstances, furnished your father with money with which to escape. Mr. Bankner, a few weeks before he gave me the ring, saw your father and told him of you. Your father bought the ring, had the inscription put in it, and intended to bring it to you himself. However, at the request of Mr. Bankner, he had returned to the scene of the killing for trial and was mobbed. Mr. Bankner secured the ring before his death and gave it to me for you. Now, as we are about to leave for the West within a year, Mr. Bankner would like to have you to serve in his family. He holds himself somewhat responsible for your father's death and would like to help you. I would have told you this before, but Agnes asked me to leave it to her. Mrs. Wakeley now left the room, giving Agnes a stern look on the way out. Aunt Agnes, sobbed Tesney. I have been deceived as to my father and maybe as to my mother. Has you been deceived in me too, child? Yes. Then marry George and be deceived in him. It cannot be, Aunt Agnes. Now I'll say the rest of that speech I told you about. You may marry George yet. Mr. Bankner may hear about this. He shall hear from it. Do you think he'd ever let you stay in his house then? Tesney left the room in silence. George, you trifling rascal, come here. I got things started, son. Listen, watch me. You don't deserve it, but watch me. Tell Mr. Bankner that Tesney says that he is her father. Go. You good as got Tesney now. Go. As George went out the door, 
Agnes added. That's a trifling rascal, but he's my George. Agnes began to grind the coffee, but stopped to abuse the cook. George contrived to have the message of Agnes reach Mr. Bankner's ears. Agnes, in turn, told Tesney that the rich white man knew of her suspicion. Tesney looked at the ring and said, I am Tesney the Deceived. A few months after this, Mr. Bankner sent his wife and children to Europe and came to board with Mrs. Wakeley. Tesney, knowing that George had had his mother's message delivered, feared the result. She worried until she was a mere skeleton of her former self. I cannot face my blunder, she said. I must leave. She accordingly rented a room and lived alone. In a short time, she took to her bed as the result of isolation and worry. When Agnes heard of Tesney's illness, she said, This is our chance, son. Her 350 pounds were soon at Tesney's bedside. Tesney was flighty. George and the preacher came. George held her hand while the preacher asked questions. George answered for himself, and Agnes answered for Tesney. A week passed. Tesney arose from her pillow and said to Agnes, Are you here? Yes, child, answered Agnes. And George, your husband, is here too. George, my husband, ejaculated Tesney. Yes, child, said the preacher, who happened to be present. I married you to him a week ago. Tesney swooned and fell back upon her pillow. When next conscious of her surroundings, Tesney found herself in bed in a log cabin with her 350-pound tormentor still at her side. From that time until her death, she was a prisoner. Not more than a dozen times did she seem sane. She would stand before the glass and ask for her old self. Sometimes she called Agnes a girl. Then she would call her a woman. Agnes, she said on one occasion, here's a rope, let us skip. When Tesney's baby boy was between three and four weeks old, George was killed in a drunken brawl. Two days after, he was buried, a short distance from the house. Tesney was in bed. Agnes did not go to the grave. She dragged her 350 pounds outdoors to cool, cry, and repent. Tesney took a looking glass from under her pillow and looked at herself. Tesney has come back again, she said. This is her face. This is her hair. Tesney has come back again. Then, turning to the wasting child at her side, she said, Don't cry, little rascal. You are George, like your father. Little fool, don't cry. Night will soon come. You may go then. Cry. Cry, little George. Stop! Stop! Tesney fell asleep. After several hours, she was awakened by the crying of her baby. It was night. She took the baby in her arms and stole softly out of the house in her bare feet. She went straight to George's grave and sat down upon it. Little rascal, she said to the baby, your father is in the ground and can't steal me any more. Agnes can't follow me. You must not be a big George. How you are growing. Stop. I'll hold your legs and arms. Stop. You won't. You must. She dug a hole in the top of the grave with her hands. She placed the baby in it and covered it as well as she could. She then sat on a stump nearby and said not a word for several minutes. Tesney, sitting there, paid no heed to the rising wind nor the distant flash of lightning. Presently it thundered. She arose, put her hand to her ear like one at a telephone, and waited. It thundered again. She leaned to listen. There was more lightning. My name? asked she. It is Tesney. There were renewed thunder and lightning. My baby? asked she. I sent it up. Is it there? Again it thundered. Again the lightning flashed. Is it not there? she asked. I must come with it? All right. 
Welcome. She ran to the grave and uncovered the baby. It kicked feebly and gave a faint cry. I knew you were still here, she said. The voice of the clouds said so. A terrible storm was breaking. Listen, little rascal. We go together. Listen. The voice is coming. We go. We go. These were her last words. She embraced the baby and sat calmly down upon the grave amid the raging elements. The storm's fury lasted an hour or more. The next morning, Tesney and the baby were lying dead on George's grave. Agnes had Tesney and the baby buried in the same grave with George. After ten years of terrible mental and bodily suffering, Agnes died. A certain part of each day during this time, she spent looking at Tesney's ring and praying aloud. Some said that her intense agony and earnest prayer thoroughly purged her soul of guilt. Others said not so. God knows. The End